The biggest part of that state budget is 50% that we spend on K-12 education and why those decisions are made. Is that the right amount of money? Should those decisions be invested in the people, in the legislature, or should we continue to do what we've been doing, which is effectively cede that authority to the judiciary? And with that, I will turn it over to John Donnelly from the Coalition for Fair Funding to talk about constitutional law as our dessert course uh, for the morning. So thank you, John. Nothing like being the last speaker in a three-hour policy discussion. Uh, so I'm, I'm all that there is between you and the door. Uh, no, it is also, it's, it's actually exciting to come in here and after the line of questioning right there, I'm here to give you at the most conservative estimate, I'm here to give you a billion dollar savings. All you have to do is do what I'm asking you to do and pass a constitutional amendment. Uh, and you know, I say that somewhat in jest, but it's it's absolutely true uh, that that and that's only on the the what the court says we have to do for inflationary issues. That's not even going back to saying, well, the court shouldn't have told us anything and moving forward. So, uh, as James said, I am John Donnelly. I'm with Divine Donnelly and Murray Governmental Affairs. I'm, I'm an attorney with Divine and Donnelly LLC as well. So I, I tell people that I'm a, when I went to law school, I decided I wanted to become a lobbyist because it's a double negative and it actually makes me an all right guy. Uh, so uh, we did start last year. We the we worked. The Coalition for Fair Funding was formed uh, to push a constitutional amendment in the state of Kansas. Uh, and I'm gonna, just going to go real quick through kind of the basic backgrounds of the, what the Kansas Constitution says, what it does, and then I'll tie it into what we're trying to do and who we are exactly. Uh, but real quick, you know, the Kansas Constitution, what, what is a constitution? And basically, it's, it, the Black's Law Dictionary definition is actually very good. It's an organic and fundamental law of a nation or state which may be written or unwritten, establishing the character and conception of its government, laying the basic principles to which its government uh, and regulating, distributing, it w of which it's governed, and regulating, distributing, and limiting the functions of its different departments. I think that's the key part that we're gonna that we're really hitting on with this constitutional amendment effort that we're working on. It's the separation of powers, the separation of departments issue, uh, and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail here in a bit. But the the main provision that we're looking at was adopted in 1966. Uh, it's Article Six. Uh, or Article 4, Section 6B of the Kansas Constitution, uh, the legislature shall make suitable provision for finance of the educational interests of the state. I guarantee in 1966 when the legislature passed this by two-thirds to amend the Constitution and the people of the state of Kansas passed this by over 50 percent, they probably didn't know that these 15 words, specifically the word suitable, they probably didn't know that that would create 50 years of litigation to try to figure out what exactly they meant. I'm sure they knew what they meant. Uh, if, if you look back, I think it, it was basically a statement saying, okay, a political statement saying, look, we're gonna provide education to our, our students. I don't think any, I would be shocked to say that anybody or the people that voted that provision in thought that this would be a way for the Supreme Court of the state of Kansas to say how much money we have to spend to make on education issues in the state of Kansas. And, and quite frankly, that's what it's become over the years. I know I, I wasn't here earlier, but I know yesterday uh, Dave made a good comment and showed, I think it was the 1994 school finance case, uh, where the Supreme Court at that time said, we, can, we cannot tell you what to spend. So at that time, the Supreme Court, I, in my mind, was actually on point on, on what their power was. They were to basically determine the constitutionality, but they cannot, they don't have the power of the purse. That's left to the legislature. Uh, Montoy uh, later in the early 2000s took a different approach and they set a specific amount that the legislature had to spend and I think the public backlash to that then has created the Gannon opinions which don't go all they don't say how much you should spend but they hint at okay you need to keep spending more until we say it's okay so they don't give the specific amount but they keep saying you have to spend more uh, yes Sorry to interrupt. no you're fine I was going to say it should be six. That's what I, I said Article Six. I, I think I, I, when I read that, I tried to say six, and then I looked, and it was four. So appreciate it. <laughs> no, that's all right. Yeah, it's six, Section Six. Uh, so, what is suitable, and what have the courts determined that to be? Uh, basically, what the Kansas courts in Montoy and uh, Gannon have said is that suitable a suitable education is an equitable and adequate education. Uh, equitable has evolved to mean school districts must have reasonably equal access to substantially similar educational opportunities through similar tax effort. So basically what that's saying is that the school district in 
I'll just use my, in Canopolis, USD 327 in Ellsworth County, Ellsworth, Kansas, Ellsworth, Canopolis, should have the same educational opportunities. The students there should have the same educational opportunities as Blue Valley school districts in Johnson County. That's what the equitability issue is, is saying. The equitability issue does create some, some cost issues, but more of those cost issues are related to what I would say they're more from political differences. Basically, in order to get school finance bills passed, you have to have a perfect balance of 50% of everybody, uh, in, including Johnson County legislators, Sedgwick County legislators, rural legislators. Uh, so in order to get that balance, sometimes provisions are put in there specifically to local option budgets is usually what equitability goes to, uh, which is local property tax efforts, local efforts of property taxpayers. And that's where the Supreme Court is, that can become a cost driver because sometimes the politics are such where well, I wouldn't say sometimes, generally the way it's been in the past 30 years when the school finance package is passed, it's usually involving rural legislators and Johnson County legislators are cutting the deal and eventually. Uh, and, and a lot of times in order to get the Johnson County legislators on, you have to give them more local authority to raise their taxes in order to get this passed. So then the court has come in and said, well, okay, but that's inequitable because that's not fair to the Wichita School District or other school districts in the state. And I'm just using that, I'm painting that very broadly. Uh, so that is what that means, is that all students should have the access to the same education. <laughs> Adequacy is probably where the big money, uh, the, the power of the purse uh, discussion is, takes more uh, or has more uh, uh, weight, I guess. Uh, and that adequacy is achieved when school finance system is reasonably calculated to have all Kansas public education <laughs> students meet or exceed the capacity set out in ROWS versus the Council for Better, edu better Education. Those are what they call the ROWS standards. Uh, that's, a, that's a case out of Kentucky uh, from 1989, you'll see there, uh, that creates the ROWS standard. So when the, the, I think it was Gannon two or three, I don't remember, uh, said that, that the ROWS standards are what we need to meet, the legislature at first, kind of, I, I mean, some of the legislators in the room may have a different perspective on this, but I think the first response or the first thought was, oh, the ROWS standards, all we have to do is put that in the, in the statute book say that's what this money's going towards, problem solved, the Supreme Court will answer it. Well, that's, that, in theory, that would be good if the Rose standards actually were objective standards. Uh, but, so what they did is they passed it, they put it in the, in the statute book. Uh, basically, every accredited school in Kansas will teach subjects and areas required by the Board of Education. They'll teach the subjects and areas of instruction necessary to meet the graduation requirement ad adopted by the Board of Education and they'll be designed to achieve the goal established by the legislature of providing each and every child with at least the following cap capacities, which are the ROSE capacities, the ROSE standards. So this is what, this is summarized, it's not exact. This is what the ROSE standards are. Re you can read through there, I'm not going to, uh, but you'll see that those are not objective standards. It's a very, I mean, every sufficient understanding, sufficient knowledge, you can't measure that. That's just a subjective standard. That is a, that is a lawyer's dream. That's a Supreme Court justice's dream because, or this Supreme Court justice's dream, I should say, uh, these ones, uh, because it, it leaves them all of the room in the world to continue to do what they've been doing and to allow the court to drive the cost of public education. Uh, so I'm not saying these are wrong, these are great goals, but basically what the court said is you need an adequate education is enough money to meet all of the aspirational goals that the Kansas State Board of Education can come up with. Uh, so that, that's one of the problems we have. So what we've seen then is nearly 50 years of litigation, uh, plaintiffs bringing suits claiming that some aspect of the school finance law does not meet the constitutional requirements. I can't remember exactly when the first suit was filed, but I think it was in the early, like 73 comes to mind. Anyways, it's been 50 years essentially uh, that we've been dealing with this. Uh, there have been numerous studies commissioned by the legislature that have fun found inadequate funding and repeated calls for more funding to achieve the goals, which is what I said earlier. Basically, if you look at the studies, especially the Taylor study from the last year, what they look at is, okay, we need to meet the goals that, we, that the State Board of Education sets out uh, because that's what the statute says. Well, the goals are aspirational goals. The goals are 95% graduation rate. You know what the highest graduation rate in the nation is? 91% in Iowa. 95%, we're not going to get there. I mean, it's, it's, it's an aspirational goal. It's great. It's an aspirational goal. I wish we could get there, but unless we lower our standards, it's going to be very difficult to get there. Uh, so that, that's the issue either. So, so these studies say you have to spend more money to get there and more money, more money to get there. 
Uh, the last one, I think, was $2.1 billion is what they were saying. Uh, so basically what the courts have done is they find the proposals that the legislature comes forward and they find them insufficient to, set the go uh, to meet the goals. Uh, I just went over this, the 90, this Taylor study. Um, so basically what the legislature was looking at here in the last, couple, last year, and they've grappled with this for years, uh, decades, uh, is do we need to have a constitutional amendment to re reset the balance of power between the courts and the legislature? And I want to start, before I dive into some of the details on the specific constitutional amendment, I, I think this has been painted a little bit as a conservative versus liberal issue. It's been painted as a Republican-Democrat issue. It's not. This is strictly a good governance separation of powers issue. I think if you look back in history, the, the politics of this, I mean, these are the same issues that our founding fathers of this country were dealing with, and they decided that the separation of powers and the power of the purse needed to go with the legislature. So this is just basically trying to get, put that power back from the courts to the legislature is what we're attempting to do. Uh, the day before we had the hearing on, uh, on the constitutional amendment, uh, they had legislative research and the attorney general come in, the House committee, Judiciary Committee did. Uh, and, and I think the commentary from uh, the attorney general was very spot on on this to, to kind of show that this isn't about politics. It's about, it's about having the good discussion and whether we are headed down the right path of good governance in the state of Kansas. And I'll just read it here. Is, he, he testified that he respectfully suggested it's time for a thoughtful global discussion in our state about whether Article 6, Section 6, I got it right that time, <laughs> of the Kansas Constitution it is, as it is currently written and as it has been interpreted over the past half century truly reflects how the people of the state of Kansas intend these important decisions about school funding to be made. He said, let me be quick to emphasize that I am not urging a thoughtful and global discussion, not an ad hoc response to the funding decisions at hand, not an excuse of inaction, for inaction, not a method for some to vent disagreement with the Supreme Court or others to vent disagreement with the legislature. Basically what he's saying, we need to have this discussion. We need to decide if it's time to let the people of the state of Kansas tell us if this is what they meant in 1966 or whether what they meant in 1966 still applies today. Uh, the other thing I'd say about constitutional amendments, uh, you know, a lot of, one of the arguments that we had is, oh, look, the Constitution, it's a sacred document. You don't want to be, you don't want to be monkeying with that too often. And, and, you know, I think at the federal level, you see that that's probably more of a, a, a powerful argument. At the state level, we've made tons of amendments to the Kansas Constitution. The last one I can remember was determining how boats should be treated for property tax purposes. I mean, we've gotten that specific. I mean, we're not talking about freedom of speech type things, you know, the, the Bill of Rights. This is, it's not uncommon to, to make these types of chan changes to the Kansas Constitution. Uh, all you have to have is the two-thirds majority in each chamber and then the majority vote of the people of the state of Kansas. Uh, so what is the Kansas Coalition for Fair Funding? Uh, we're a 501c4 that was organized to provide a platform for interested parties to engage in the legislative and electoral process to pass this constitutional amendment. Uh, basically the key point that we're doing, the separation of powers issue, what I've been talking about. Uh, you know, we place the power to tax and appropriate funds with the legislature because they are the most directly responsive group to the people, to their constituents. That is how, that is how they are designed. Uh, the original members of the uh, coalition, just so you know, the first three members that actually had the initial discussions uh, regarding this were actually uh, the Kansas Chamber, the Kansas Farm Bureau, and the Kansas Contractors Association. And I know some of you in here are fairly, fairly active in Kansas politics, but when you have the Kansas Chamber and the Kansas Contractors Association joining to form a coalition like this, that sends a fairly powerful signal because generally they're not on the same end of the political spectrum. The contractors generally are supporting more of the more Democrats and more moderate Republican candidates. The chamber generally supports more, uh, more of the conservative candidates. And then you have the Kansas Farm Bureau that's actually kind of, I would say, somewhat of the more nonpartisan in, in a sense uh, organization. But for that wide of array of individuals and groups to be interested in this constitutional amendment sends a message that, look, this is a serious problem. Um, 
the other groups that have come on board since the coalition was formed, those founding members came up with that. Uh, the Kansas Petroleum Marketers and Convenience Store Association, uh, the Kansas Corn Growers, uh, Kansas Livestock Association, Kansas Grain and Feed Association, National Federation of Independent Businesses. The coalition is growing, and quite frankly, it probably has stalled out a little bit because after the legislative session ended, there, the, it hasn't been as discussed as much. Uh, but I know other groups are continuing to have this conversation. In fact, the coalition, we've had conversations with people in higher education that want the, higher, the Board of Regents to get involved, the community colleges to get involved, uh, because their prop, the way they look at it is, is that, look, if we keep putting all of the money into K-12 education, and basically the legislature has no control of it, higher ed's probably the, next, the, the, mo the easiest thing to cut. Uh, oddly enough, I think part of the reason they haven't jumped on, I think is probably because they're probably trying to decide, well, do we want to join on and, uh, with this constitutional amendment or do we want to get included into the K-12 treatment and become, const the courts determine that we are a, an, an absolute right as well. Uh, so that, that's kind of the politics of it. Uh, it's, it's been an interesting thing. I think the hearing that we had uh, was very good. I think the key points that we brought out you know, that, that the legislature is the best body to balance all the needs of the state. It goes back to, uh, I think, uh, Representative Humphreys, you were saying that, you know, basically our budget's driven by K-12 education, which the way we are now, we have no control over. We're basically ceded control to the courts. Caseloads, the legislature over the years has decided that, you know, because of tying on to federal programs, we basically have no control over those. So that, that right there is 70% of our budget at least. If you would throw higher ed in there, you get to 85 to 90% of our budget. So the question becomes, and this is a key question about good governance and separation of powers is, when is enough enough? I mean, look, it's easy to, politically, it's easy to just say, oh, look, they're telling us we have to do this. Well, that's not what the legislative body was created to do. They were created to handle these tough issues, and it's our belief that they have the ability to balance all of those needs, including do we want good roads? Do we want good public safety? At what level does government need to be involved in all of these aspects? So uh, that, that's the, the main talking points, the main reasons that we've been pushing this. Uh, I'd say here, uh, this is the amendment that we have. Uh, essentially, what, what, it, what we did in the amendment, and a lot of this dealt with politics uh, as well, but the amendment as it came out of committee essentially said that all questions of equity are, can be litigated and within the, are there within the realm of the courts. Some people don't like that, but in order to get some rural legislators and others to, to move forward on that, I think it makes sense to do that. But questions of adequacy, which are the real cost drivers, that is solely in the purview of the legislature. So that's the, I don't want to get into the details of the language because I'm sure the language will change. It changed, I can tell you, I've probably seen 30 drafts of constitutional amendments in the last month of the legislative session. Uh, and it was amended in, in the committee to more reflect the discussion. Uh, with all that said, I do think the committee hearing that we had in the House, and it was passed out of the House, uh, I thought it was a great committee hearing. It was probably one of the best hearings that I recall on just on constitutional law and government and the roles that the legislature and the courts ha should have. Uh, and I think people on all sides of the issue actually would say that it was very well done, and we hope to continue that dialogue as we move forward. Uh, so that's really, that's just separation power stuff. That's just more for questions. So I guess, are there any questions that any of you have for me uh, now or, yeah, Carl? Oh, sorry. James, Wait. You're going to be in charge. <laughs> well, let me begin. Uh, the federal side, Article 3, Section 2, gives the Congress the power to limit the court's jurisdiction. That's one approach to, to consider. Mm -hmm. The second point I'd like to make and appreciate your comments on. In the U.S. Constitution, Article 4, Section 4, it's not one of the better known sections, guarantees each of the state a Republican form of government. Under this whole series of litigation, 229, Montoy, all the Gannon iterations, I would make the argument we're a judicial oligopoly. Uh, no, uh, judici judicial uh, oligarchy and uh, got to be a little careful there. Sorry, I misspoke. Um, and I think that a good case could be made taking it into federal court where they have often ruled that state provisions, whether statutory or constitutional, cannot uh, conflict with the U.S. Constitution. And Article 4, Section 4 doesn't, would not 
allow an appointed body to be making appropriation decisions by a body of government. No, I, I agree, and I think that's a great argument for future litigation to be moving. I'm, I'm not smart enough to be a litigator or smart enough to make that kind of money, so I'm just a poor old lobbyist, so I'm trying to find the easy way and do it through the legislative channels. But I think you're exactly right. I think there's a very good arguments that they've overstepped their bounds. We shouldn't have to do a constitutional amendment, but we are where we are because we haven't had that litigation move forward. I think those are great points. All right. <clears throat> yes, thank you. As a legislator, I, I, I do understand that the hearing was a great success and that was a, a good move forward. But I voted against, against the funding because we didn't have the discussion on the House floor. And I, I felt like we needed to get that before we did funding because it was too easy to say, hey, we're done now. And I, and I know there was plenty of reasons to go ahead and vote for it uh, in a technical fashion. But what do you, what do you uh, suggest to us as legislators coming into this session? Great point, uh, great, great commentary. I, I would say, you know, we were often asked, where were we on the vote count? last session on the constitutional amendment and if you as you know the the politics in the legislature got really ugly right at the end between the house and the senate um i i would have put us before some of the senate leadership made some of the comments of really pushing for the constitutional amendment vote which i agreed with uh, I, we were probably about seven votes short in the house after that happened i let's just say my rear end was very sore from many of the <laughs> butt chewings that I took from people that had flipped and they were not with us anymore because they became angry. At, they felt like they were being pushed into a corner, which quite frankly is sometimes what you have to do in the legislative process. So uh, then we were probably 20 some votes short would be my, in my opinion. Uh, there were a lot of people that flipped because of that and it was emotion. It wasn't based on the issue. So I guess what I would say is the question now becomes, when is this ripe? When, when is a vote on this ripe for actual passage? You know, that we can take votes and we can, they can go down in a blaze of glory, uh, but generally that's not the strategy we like to take uh, as lobbyists, that's just not our style, uh, meaning Divine Donnelly and Murray. But um, I think the question then becomes is we've got a gubernatorial race that's gonna play very key in this. Uh, we've got one candidate, uh, the Republican candidate has said he's 100% on board with the constitutional amendment. Um, the Democratic candidate is not. I mean, we know she's not from discussions we had with her in the Senate. Uh, so the question then becomes, the governor really doesn't have a role other than the bully pulpit that they have, that, that they can help define, direct the narrative. So the question becomes, you know, whether the governor's support will help push us over the edge uh, or the governor's opposition will help push us over the edge. The last, the time we have ever been closest to passing something like this was when Kathleen Sebelius was governor. So the question becomes, are, do we just have to keep spending, do they just have to keep spending more before people finally say enough is enough? And I hope that's not the, the answer, but I'm afraid it is. So that's a really long answer, uh, but that's how I see the situation. And you know, reasonable minds can differ on that. It's politics after all, so. Thank you. All right, yeah. last question right here, Renee. Thank you. We talk about the 15 words in, in Article 6, mm -hmm. Section 6, but it seems like we stop after Word 8, which is um, oh. providing for the, the suitable finance. My question is, as you look at the last five words, it looks to me like the legislature is the one who defines educational interests of the state. Do we have a definition of educational interests of the state? And if so, how do we manage that with local control? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, what are the educational interests of the state? I would say we've probably ceded some of that control to the courts as well when they say that we need to go to the Rose standards and then we put them in statutes. Is that right? I don't know that it is. Uh, so I. I believe that it is within the legislature's purview and what the legislature I believe intended to do with some of the major changes that we've made uh, specifically on school consolidation and other issues is that we did exactly what you said we want to provide the education we're going to provide local school districts with the support they need to educate our children but we still want you to make those decisions because they think you can make those the locals can make those decisions more effectively uh, and the question though that have we created a system that loses, and I think Dave's 
presentation points this out, have we created a system that while noble in goals, in, in function, it is not working adequately because we are not, the state, while providing the funds with no control over it, uh, they basically have just said, okay, there's your money, and, and it basically becomes money that can just be spent however they want, in a sense. I mean, that, that's a little bit of a simplified version. So I believe that, yes, the legislature should have that power and should be defining the educational interests of the state, but I also think that the courts have tried to insert themselves to drive that discussion. We need to be more focused on that. Instead of the suitability. Well, both, but that gets left off. I, I agree. That's a good point. I was like, wait a minute. We need to look at this through defining what are the educational interests of the state. It's almost backwards looking mm -hmm. at the funding before we even know what our educational interests of the state is. I'll, yeah, I'll admit I've never actually looked at it like that. It's, that's an interesting point. I need to think through that a little bit more. So uh, thanks for raising that. Thank you, John. Yeah, thanks, James. So thank you all very, very much for coming. Have a good one.